Okay, so this is yet another roundup review. This is the third one, I believe. I haven't done this in a little bit. It took me a while to write and re uh, get this one done. But you guys know how this works. No introduction needed. Let's just get right into it. Starting off with a movie that has been on my radar for quite some time now. While it was bashed by audiences and a good majority of the general public, loads of critics and people I know ended up loving it. For some reason, that always makes me want to seek out a movie more, just so I can weigh in on with what my opinion is and pick a side. With Never Rarely Always Sometimes, I started off firmly in the camp of the audience. The listless stumbling of events, the flat atmosphere, the protagonist constantly being miserable all the time. It's pretty much a checklist of elements to a movie that is not my thing at all. Movies that portray characters with depression or other mental health issues like that really have to nail what the feeling is like. Or it comes off really pretentious, dumb, or even distasteful. One of the worst things a movie can commit, in my opinion, is a lead character being miserable, but not executed well at all. That's the path I saw this movie going down in the first 20 minutes. However, the more and more the movie went on, the more it started to click for me. Can the overall message and themes of the movie be a bit too much at times? Yes. Some of the scenes are a little overbearingly on the nose, but the majority of the movie is an honest and genuine depiction of a teen struggling through the process of getting an abortion. While I obviously never have or have to go through this experience, it was clear that Eliza Hittman, the director slash writer of the film, took the time to really nail down what it's actually like. And as the movie went on, its more tedious nature started to make more sense. It perfectly portrayed the feeling of numbness when it feels like you don't have control over your own life. Something that I feel like almost anyone can relate to. Even if there are some moments that really bother me about this movie, I can look past some of them for how good the movie is as a whole. And while I completely understand why someone would find this movie extremely boring, it really clicked with me. Never rarely sometimes always gets an A- from me. Honestly, this movie was just kind of sad. Impractical Jokers, even if it's in its decline, is still a very funny show, and this movie just feels like a cash grab version of that. Practical Jokers the movie gets a D plus. This movie was bad. Even if I chuckled at the skits, they weren't anything to write home about. In fact, they would make for a pretty bland episode of the show. They didn't go further than the show could in the show, they didn't do riskier practical jokes. It was just more the same and that just made it feel pretty unnecessary. So in my mind, it was inevitable that this movie would come up short for me. And for once, I wasn't wrong in my prediction. To be completely honest, I was not looking forward to this movie whatsoever. As a longtime fan of the show, a movie well past its peak, both creatively and popularity-wise, just seemed like a last-ditch effort to make the show relevant again. Even if I still love that show, it hasn't been as funny as it once was. Honestly, this movie was just kind of sad. Impractical Jokers, even if it's in its decline, is still a very funny show, and this movie just feels like a cash grab version of that. Practical Jokers the movie gets a D plus. The second ever HBO Max original movie is the second of two movies about two girls traveling to another state for one of them to get an abortion on this round of review. Never thought I would say that. But that's not a knock against either film. Besides the premise, Unpregnant and Never Rarely Sometimes Always couldn't be more different. Unpregnant is a road trip movie filtered through a modern lens, and it enjoyed it is enjoyable for the most part. Not the most original or best written teen comedy out there, but I still kinda had fun with it. That mostly has to do with the performance of Haley Lou Richardson. Not only is her character very likable, but the energy and care that she brings to the role is really surprising. She is damn good in this movie, and I was not expecting her to have acting chops like this. We all knew she was likable from The Edge of Seventeen and Split, here she really comes into her own, proving that she can carry a movie. Rachel Lee Goldenberg also did a pretty solid job helming this movie. From what I found, from what I found online, she's only directed straight to DVD crap, so this movie is kind of a shocker that's completely uh, well directed. Nothing too crazy or Oscar worthy, just pretty good. This movie honestly could have been one of my favorites of the year. There is enough good about it to warrant something like that. However, there's one majorly glaring flaw in this film that holds it back immensely. The character of Bailey. Well, it might just be me on this one, she is so, so unlikable. I mean downright insufferable. 
And that has nothing to do with the actress that played her. Barbie Fiera did the best job she could with such an annoying and endlessly unfunny character. Every line that came out of her mouth is more cringeworthy than the next, especially compared to Veronica, who is such a likable character. She seems like the most obnoxious person on the planet, the quirky girl stereotype done to the absolute death here. I honestly do hate to say that, because I really like the rest of this movie. It's just a shame that she is such a big part of the movie, and such a terrible character. So unfortunately, the best I could give this uh, movie a grade-wise was a B. really wish it could have been higher. This is a movie I've wanted to see ever since Chris Stuckman spoke so highly of it. On premise alone, it had me very, very intrigued. However, for whatever reason, I didn't think we had Amazon Prime Video. Don't ask me why I didn't at the very least check back when it dropped back all the way in May, but I just didn't. Then one day I scrolled through the Amazon Fire Stick menu and realized we did, in fact, have Prime Video, and I felt like an absolute dumbass. I digress though, this was a really good lower budget sci-fi movie. What it lacked in the technical aspect of the movie more than made up for it with its excellent script, amazing performances, and nail-biting tension. This movie held my attention right from the get-go, establishing the tone and setting in such a way that felt instantly familiar. The movie captures the vibe of being a Twilight Zone episode without being a complete rip-off of the show. The movie did an immaculate job of pulling you into its world and it kept you there with the incredible dialogue. Craig W. Sanger and James Montoig, Jesus, Montoig, I don't know how to say their names, both penned just an excellent script. Witty and engaging dialogue, interesting characters, an enthralling story, these guys hit it out of the park with this script. And seeing how they are both first-time writers, I'm going to be keeping my eye out for them. This is, what a, you know, what a debut script. And same goes for the director, Andrew Patterson. Despite the movie having a very limited budget, it had a very interesting visual style and there were some really cool shots in this thing. Patterson really captures that era of sci-fi to a T with this movie, and I'm very much looking forward to what he'll be directing in the future. Besides having a lot of technical issues with lighting, you know, color grading, just really budgetary uh, problems with the movie, I really, really like The Best of Night. And I'm going to give it an A-. And for the final movie on this uh, round of review is yet another one that I didn't know I could see because I didn't know I had Amazon Prime. Now it may seem like this movie is a way too recent to be appearing on this roundup review, only coming out a week ago from filming this. Uh, seeing how movies like The Old Guard, Scoob, and The Outpost are all available on streaming services right now, don't worry, I'll get to those in the next one. But I really want to talk about le at least one of the new Welcome to the Blumhouse uh, movies. A horror production company that's been really prominent over the past five years, Blumhouse, is working in tandem with Amazon Prime to release eight new thrillers all throughout October, mostly made up of uh, up-and-coming filmmakers. Which is a pretty cool idea in theory, at least to me. However, is it a good enough one in practice? And is Black Box good enough to warrant me covering any of the other movies? Well, I'd say yes to both of those questions. Now, before you get too excited, this isn't a great movie. Not by a long shot. The scares were too minimal, the weird overuse of handheld shots, and the story being a little too incoherent uh, at times, especially towards the end, really hold it back from being a really solid sci-fi thriller. However, I believe the central performance from Maudemo Athi, I, I, I know I butchered that name, uh, which is so great, and the concept and main storyline was so interesting. Uh, it really made the film that much more enjoyable. The dialogue isn't the greatest, and the scares could have been so much better, but Athi's performance really makes this movie all the more compelling. He was fantastic in this movie. Even if Black Box isn't perfect, it's an interesting enough start to a cool idea, and it is home to a really good breakout performance. So keep this guy in mind. He's... I... Don't be surprised if he's in a great movie. Uh, nothing special, but good enough in my book. Black Box gets a B-. And that is it for uh, the third round of review. Finally, I got it done. Finally, I watched the, the fifth movie. Took me forever. 
But uh, yeah, that's it. Let me know what uh, Halloween movies you guys want me to cover, what other movies, you know, new releases. Just let me know. I'll see you guys later.